Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Wendy Watson! <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right, are you ready for a little bit of exercise? OK, yes. everybody stand up, please. Put your arms out, take a big deep breath. Inhale, let your arms come up and around. And push the energy as you exhale down through the ground. Awesome, does that feel good? All right, go ahead and have a seat. I know some of you are excited for my speech on my 70-20-10 rule and how to transform your communication from chaos to clarity. Before we do that, God wants to give me guys a little bit of a message. I have only had one exemplary male role model in my life, which was my maternal grandfather, and he passed away when I was 14. My dad eventually has come around, but in the last 10 months, I have met the most amazing people, mostly through my contacts with Achieve. And I have to tell you, the people that I've met and the men that I've met, and there's almost a dozen of them in here that are exemplary men, are changing the imprints in my mind on how I interact and see men. Yes. And so I wanna thank you for that. And I ask you guys to please continue to be the exemplary men that I've met this weekend. Amen. And women, please know that you deserve these kind of men and allow yourself to open up to them. Amen. Yes. So communication seems to be a big thing this weekend, right? How do you quantify communication? So I have always, it is my spirit. I've always been a truth speaker. I cannot be anything else. Even when I think about, oh, maybe I should, no, I can't. It's not true to myself. I just can't do it. Even when I was two years old, I was playing with my sister and my cousins at my uncle's house, and I came out to get some water. Every, all the adults love razzing each other, right? Love giving each other a hard time. But when you're two years old, you don't know that. So. I hear my uncle, my dad's brother, giving my mom a hard time, and I walk up to him and tell him, you're not allowed to speak to my mother that way. <laughs> and he's like, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, little miss two-year-old? And he looks at my dad, and my dad's like, what do you want me to do? She's <laughs> defending her mother, I'm not gonna tell her not to. Right? That is just, me, that's the way I've always been. When my parents divorced when I was eight, as a cancer and an empath, it broke me. It traumatized me. They broke up my family, this safe home that is supposed to teach me all about this world. And it made me angry. What do you think that did to my communication? It made it angry. I didn't treat people very well. On top of that, my mother felt so bad for the divorce, she would spoil us. I would go, if she invited us, to go run errands with her, I would go only because I knew that there would be a department store and I knew that there would be shopping and I knew I would get something. <laughs> Even into my first marriage, I continued that habit. I couldn't go shopping for him, whether it's socks and underwear and jeans or whatever, without buying something for myself. So let's add in some selfish communication along with that angry communication. Do you think that boded well for healthy relationships? Not at all. My dad was a contractor. We would go work with him on spring breaks, on the weekends. So I'm the boss's daughter, 16, telling grown men what to do and how to do it. Do you think they like that? <laughs> but it taught me how to be assertive. That didn't do well when I went to the office working with a bunch of women. I cannot tell you how many jobs I got fired from for being abrasive. But at the same time, they wouldn't tell me what that meant. They wouldn't give me examples. They wouldn't train me. They would just, in California, they would just let you go because there's another 100 to 200 applications waiting to take your job, right? So my mom used to, my mom always says, 
that they knew they never knew what was going to come out of my mouth when i got upset i would go to my room i'd deal with my emotions i would come out i would walk right up to the person that i wanted to speak to regardless of what they were doing regardless of who was in the room tell them what i needed to say turn around and walk away not even give them a chance to respond rebuttal anything <laughs> As I was writing this book, I'm talking with my family through it. And she's like, you would leave so many people in tears. Just turn around and walk away because I was angry and I was selfish. Advance a couple decades. I'm now living in Phoenix. I've got my second job. Can you imagine being raised by entrepreneurs, being a woman, having perfectionism? I was an absolute perfectionist with angry, selfish communication in the corporate world, in accounting. <laughs> my I didn't do well with building relationships especially at work because I didn't take no for an answer in construction there's always a way to round it you have to think outside the box to give the clients what they need what they ordered what they asked for you have to get creative there is no no well corporate America doesn't like that <laughs> right so my manager comes up to me one day, and my audit manager, and he sits down and he's like, look, we have a 70-20-10 rule. As long as 70% of the invoices go through without incident, 20% gets escalated to management, and 10% we write off. That is our goal. I was like, <laughs> wait a minute, you're willing to write stuff off? Like, that's a new concept for me. Like, holy moly. And he was like, yeah, actually, actually, we make a plan for it. I was like, what a concept. And then it was, wait, I don't have to be perfect. Right. And then it was like, I don't have to be perfect. He gave me permission to not be perfect. And I took it and I ran with it. And then I was thinking about that 70-20-10 rule. And I started looking at it in the lens of, communication. What were people projecting at me? And I realized 70% of the people at the time that were in my circle, 70% of what they projected at me was their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Their own emotions, their own beliefs, their own preconceptions, their own judgments, all of that stuff. 20% might be a combination, but only 10% was directly personal to me or the conversation at hand. Okay, I can do the math. If only 10 to 30% of what somebody's saying to me is directly personal to me, why am I taking anything else personal? Why am I taking it in? If it's not meant for me and it's their own stuff, why am I taking it in? Why am I taking offense to it? Why am I taking it home? Why am I getting emotional over it, right? When we're at work and we, we're working on these reports or we're working on our speeches and then somebody chimes in and they give their own perspective, right? That's our baby. We get protective over it. So if somebody doesn't like it, why are we taking it in? Right? So finding the value in the conversation that you're having. Is 70% of the value of the conversation you're having the most valuable? Because that's quite the conversation that you're having. Is only 10% of it valuable? Right? I'll tell you a little story. My sister and I were on vacation with my family and her three kids. It's summertime. We're on the Colorado River, river running on the pontoon boat, tearing up the water on the jet skis. But when we're not doing that, we're sitting on the sandbar, watching the kids and the dogs play on the beach, just chatting it up and eating. And at the time, my sister and I only talked like once or twice a year. So we don't really know each other. And so we're talking about, you know, daily stuff, routines, what the kids like for dinner, all that kind of stuff. And she calls me spoiled. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Kind of took me back a little bit and it ended the conversation. And I thought about it. I'm like, why would she say that? Well, first of all, she's the older sister. Who here thinks their younger sisters or the baby of the family is spoiled? Right? Yes. They always get away with a little bit more than the older ones. Right? There's, there's that imprint. Right? She is also a teacher. 
with a family of five. Her husband is the stay at home dad. They have a 2,800 square foot house and they are in California. Mm -hmm. Do you think they have a tight budget? Mm -hmm. I remember them having to portion out food when I went over there for dinner one night. So when I told her that I eat steak and lobster for dinner twice a month, do you think that sounded extravagant to her? Absolutely. Right? So I get it, I get her perspective. I don't think I'm spoiled. I run and operate my own businesses, multiple businesses. I manage myself, I manage my house, I manage my dogs, all my social life. I don't have anybody to come take out the trash for me right. when I get home from work and I'm too tired. I don't have somebody to take me out to dinner, make me dinner when I'm too tired to cook. So if I, after a couple of weeks, if I feel like I want a nice dinner, I feel like I've earned it. Absolutely. <laughs> So while there's a difference of opinion, which is fabulous, the value comes in that we got to learn about each other, right? That 10% of the conversation was the most valuable to me because it allowed me to step into my empowerment, to step into my confidence, step into my leadership, because I love the way that I make the decisions in my life and I love the way that I run my life, right? So that's where the value comes in. I don't believe in zero value. Every, all information is good information. Every conversation has value to it, right? 70% right. had the least amount of value, but it was still valuable. But that 10% was the most valuable. And she never knew that we had this conversation until she read my book just a few months ago. And she's like, I have a ton of questions for you, <laughs> right? So where can you find the value in the conversations that you have with people? And not only that, right? Once I figured that out, then I had to flip the switch. What am I projecting on other people? What is the 70% that I'm projecting that I'm saying onto other people in the conversations that I'm having with them, in the energy? in the emotions, right? I was doing the same thing they were because I was all up here. So the more that I did my inner work, my self work, the more I learned about emotions and energy and all the spiritual ushy gushy stuff, the more I flipped that around. Most of the information that I give to people is valuable and it is particular to that conversation in that moment, right? So what is it that you're communicating? And are you being present for that conversation or are you waiting to speak, waiting for your next turn to speak? Or are you thinking about what you're gonna say next? Because if you're doing that, you're not actively listening to the conversation. Was this information useful for you? Absolutely. How are, how are we on time? You got four minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so if you haven't booked an appointment with me yet and you still are interested, I would love, I don't even, my QR code is back on my table over there. And so is my book because I didn't think to bring it up because that was all in my intuition. So um, if you'd like to buy, thank you Kent, you're amazing. Um, if anybody would like to get a copy of my book, I have a bunch of them here. Thank you, darling. This is my book. I demonstrate the 70, 20, 10 rule in 16 different ways in my book, including business metrics. If you'd like to know how I apply it in client retention, employee retention, self body image, thank you, honey. <laughs> book an appointment with me, scan this QR code. If you hold that still for just a second. I sure can. Yay. Thank you very much. Anybody wants to learn more, you know where I'm at. Thank you.